This is Rejected Knowledge, and this is the next part, whatever part this is, of The History of Tammany Hall by Gustavus Myers. It starts out with Chapter 16, Barnburners and Hunkers, 1846 to 1850. Two factions had lately arisen in Tammany Hall, the Barnburners and the Hunkers, Differences in principle had at first caused the division, but it was characterized nevertheless by a lively race for office. The barn burners were the radical Democrats who believed, among other things, that slavery should not be extended to free territory. The nickname was occasioned by the saying of a contractor a few years before, quote, These men are incendiaries. They are mad. They are like the farmer who, to get the rats out of his granary, sets fire to his own barn, unquote. The hunkers were the office-holding conservatives, very unwilling to have anything disturb their repose, and above all, opposed to the agitation of the slavery question. Their influence was thrown wherever possible with the slave-holding states. The term hunkers arose from their characteristic of striving to keep their offices to the exclusion of everybody else, quote, to get all they can and keep all they can get, unquote. The quarrel was as sharply defined throughout the state as in New York City. Such men as Samuel J. Tilden, C. C. Camberling, William F. Havemeyer, and Minthorne Tompkins were the local leaders of the barn burners. John McKeon, Lorenzo B. Shepard, Edward Stralian, Emmanuel B. Hart were some of the chiefs of the hunkers. This factional struggle, together with the dissatisfaction given by the city administration, weakened Tammany, whose nominee, in the spring election of 1847, J. Sherman Brownell was defeated by the Whig candidate William Brady. The vote stood Brady 21,310, Brownell 19,877, Ellis Drake Independent 2,078. This was the first time in nine years that the city had been carried by the Whigs proper though they were aided somewhat by the Native Americans. Barn burners and hunkers laid aside their differences momentarily when President Polk visited the city in June 1847, and one of his objects being to be initiated a member of the Tammany Society. On June 26th he was waited upon at the Astor House, by a deputation of the society headed by Elijah Purdy. Quite worn out after a torrid day of handshaking, Polk accompanied his escorts to the large room in the wigwam where members of the society were usually initiated. Later the president emerged, looking happy at having availed himself of membership in a political society which could sway presidential choices and elections, and perhaps determine his own future political fate. This incident passed, the factions resumed their quarrel, and warred so effectually that in the general election of November 1847, the Whigs again won by more than 8,000 votes. But Tammany in its darkest moments, was fertile in expedience. It now arranged a great meeting for February 5, 1848, in commendation of the Mexican War. Sam Houston and General Foote made speeches, and one of the Tammany orators assured the audience that, though Tammany, quote-unquote, erred sometimes, its, quote, patriotic ardor was never cooled, unquote. The success of this war brought thousands of voters back to the Democratic ranks in the city. Besides barn burners and hunkers were 
tiring of defeat. Neither relished exile from office all the time. They agreed on the nomination of former Mayor Havemeyer, who personally was popular, though the wigwam leaders had caused his administration to be discredited. Havemeyer was elected by the slender majority of 928 over the Whig candidate Mayor Brady. The Native American party had now about gone out of existence. But the faction soon disagreed again on national questions and sent conflicting Tammany delegations to the National Convention in Baltimore in May 1848. After tedious debate and much acrimony, both were allowed a half-vote to each delegate. When, however, it was seen that the barn burners voted with some other states in support of the principle against the extension of slavery to free territory, a movement was started to reject them. The prospect of losing the all-important electoral vote of New York State was not pleasant to the convention. To avoid the arbitrary rejection of either faction, the Committee on Credentials suggested a compromise by which it refused to open the discussion as to which faction ought to be accepted until both had pledged themselves to abide by the decision of the convention. Knowing that this would be pro-slavery, the barn burners declared that, quote, the democracy of New York must be admitted unconditionally or not at all, unquote, and they withdrew. The hunkers took the required pledge. Arriving home, the barn burner delegates issued an address saying that a faction existed among them whose object was the perpetuation and the extension of human servitude. Bold, unscrupulous, and active, it wielded to a great degree the patronage of the federal government. It addressed itself to the fears of some, to the cupidity of others. By these means it had got possession of the late National Convention and had proclaimed a candidate for the presidency, a man who obtained his nomination only as the price of the most abject subserviency to the slave power. The barn burners then took steps to name candidates in opposition to Lewis Cass and General W. O. Butler, the Baltimore nominees, who had been promptly approved by the hunker element in the wigwam. Calling Martin Van Buren from obscurity, they nominated him for president, anticipating the action of the Free Soil Convention at Buffalo in August. Throughout the slavery agitation up to the firing on Fort Sumter, the South had no firmer supporter than Tammany. In the hall, Southern representatives spoke and broadcast their doctrines on every available occasion. However ultra those doctrines might be, the wigwam audiences never missed applauding them enthusiastically. The hunkers immediately opened a series of cast meetings. Said General Stevenson at one of them in Tammany Hall, June 9, 1848, quote, All the South asks is non-interference. Unquote. He was cheered wildly. As usual, the quote-unquote regular Democratic nominations were supported by the backbone of the democracy in New York City. Those who clung to the mere name and forms of the party as well as the active men who lived in office and luxuriated on the spoils. The quote-unquote barn burners, otherwise now styled the free soilers, were quite as active as the hunkers, and their defection on election day enabled General Taylor to carry the city, the supposed democratic stronghold, by 9,000 883 votes. The dissensions in the wigwam were as pronounced in the spring of 1849, at least outwardly. The two factions held separate mayoralty conventions on the same night. 
The barn burners were naturally eager for Havermeyer, one of themselves, but he would not have the honor. Hearing that the hunkers were proposing Mindert van Schaik, an extremely popular man, the barn burners resolved to steal the hunkers' thunder by nominating him themselves. This they accordingly did, and the bewildered public was treated to the spectacle of Van Schaik standing as the candidate of both the recriminating factions. There were not wanting those who professed to see in this action an agreement between the leaders on the matter of the local offices. The Whigs elected Caleb S. Woodhull by 4,121 plurality and secured over two-thirds of the members of the Common Council. The Democrats of the quote-unquote old school, the unyielding hunkers, would not vote for a candidate the Free Soilers approved of. They either did not vote at all or voted for Woodhull. The barn burners, practically driven out of Tammany Hall by the hunkers, had been meeting elsewhere. Tiring of defeats, however, overtures for reunion were made during the fall campaign. A fusion resulted not only in the city, but in other parts of the state, and candidates were agreed upon. But no sooner had the reunion been declared that a number of irreconcilable hunkers and certain other politicians, including Daniel E. Sickles, James T. Brady, Mike Walsh, and John M. Bloodgood, formed a self-constituted, quote, Democratic-Republican Executive Committee, unquote, to oppose the deal. On the day before election, they sent out a circular denouncing the fusion and declaring that, though it promised much, it was really only a means of engrafting upon democratic time-honored principles a set of abolition doctrines, quote, hostile to the peace and welfare of the Republic and repugnant to the sympathies and intelligence of the Democratic Party, unquote. The circular was misleading. Neither the barn burners nor the hunkers had imposed any sacrifice of principle upon the other. They merely agreed for the time being to suspend their differences in order to get a controlling influence over the disbursement of municipal finances. The opinion of each voter on the slavery question was left untouched. The election was hotly contested, for by the new state constitution, the selection of minor state offices had been taken from the governor and legislature and given to the people. Owing to this defection of a strong Tammany group, the Whigs carried the city. The excitement in the wigwam, when the result became known, was intense. Four thousand Tammany men, looking either for office or party triumph, were in a frenzy. W. D. Wallach, a politician of some note, mounted the rostrum, and under the stimulus of disappointment, held forth in a long and remarkable harangue to which his auditors listened in comparative silence, though the same utterances at another time have provoked a riot in the wigwam. Men of downright dishonesty, Wallach said, had crept into the organization by the aid of bullies and loafers. These men of late years had managed to wield great power at Tammany primary elections, where, as everybody knew, matters long had been arranged, quote, upon the assumption that by a free application of money, violence, and roguery, the people could and should be controlled, <laughs> unquote. Yeah, that's calling it like it is. Like it was and like it still is. <laughs> 
What wonder was it, he asked, that thousands of quiet and respectable Democrats had ceased to bow to the authority of regular nominations, however worthy the candidates, when they found more or less of the Tammany nominating committees returned, in part notoriously by violence, if not by fraud? The breach between the barn burners and the extreme hunkers was reopened and widened by this self-constituted committee's action. It led to the formation of two bodies, each claiming to be the genuine general committee of Tammany Hall. One was led by Fernando Wood, who was suspected of being a hunker, but was too much of a politician to be active against the barn burners. This general committee was of a compromising disposition. In brief, it was composed mainly of what were known as political quote-unquote trimmers, men willing to make any sacrifices of principle for individual or party success. There's a lot of those, aren't there? The other committee, of which Henry M. Western was the head, was composed of hunkers and took up the interests of the self-formed Democratic-Republican Executive Committee. It was the first body in the North to call a meeting to denounce the Wilmot Proviso. To all intents, standing for principle, each committee sought the tremendous advantages of the possession of of Tammany Hall and its political machinery. By being recognized as the quote-unquote regular general committee, its nominations would be regular and as such would command the votes of the great mass of Democrats. To obtain that recognition, both committees realized the necessity of obtaining a majority of the Council of Sachems, which in critical moments, had so thoroughly demonstrated its legal right to eject from the wigwam any man or body of men it pleased. The opening struggle between the factions for mastery took place at the annual election of the society on April 15, 1850. Each body made desperate efforts to elect its list of sachems, the ticket in favor of a union of the factions and of reorganizing the quote-unquote Wood Committee, was headed by Elijah F. Purdy, then Grand Sachem, and contained the names Isaac Fowler, John Bogert, John Manning, and others, former Mayor Mickle, Charles O'Connor, Francis Cutting, and M. M. Noah led the rival ticket. The hunkers brought to the polls many men who, though still members of the society, long since had gone over to the Whigs and had lost the habit of attending the society's meetings. These men claimed the right to vote, and it was unquestionably theirs. In law, the Tammany Society was merely a charitable and benevolent corporation. No member in good standing could be debarred from voting. With cheerful alacrity, these Whig members lent their aid in distracting the Democratic Party into keeping up a double organization. Officeholders and other men openly attached to the Whig Party voted. When it seemed that most of the Purdy ticket was elected, the two hunker inspectors suddenly found three more hunker tickets in the box. Previously, this box had been examined, emptied, and exposed publicly. These three ballots, if counted, would have elected one more sachem of the hunker stripe, giving that faction six of the thirteen sachems, one short of a majority. The two Barn burner inspectors refused to count them. The result of the election being disputed, Purdy promptly took possession of the books and papers of the society. 
As the best solution of the troubles, the sachems, on April 26th, determined to forbid both committees' admittance to the wigwam. The sachems did not acknowledge accountability to anyone for their actions, not even to the society which elected them, representing themselves as the supreme judges of which was the real Democratic General Committee, or whether there was any, the sachems let it be understood that they would act as mediators. By a vote of ten to one, they quote-unquote recommended an action equivalent to an arbitrary order that the Wood Committee provide for the election of delegates to a convention in Tammany Hall, quote, to reorganize the New York City democracy, unquote. From the substance of the invitation sent out by the society to various conspicuous personages, it was evident that, though the Wood Committee had been favored, somehow a majority of the hunker or pro-slavery sachems was installed. The plan of a convention was accepted by both factions, but by manipulating the primary elections for delegates, Fernando Wood succeeded in filling the convention with his own creatures, allowing, for form's sake, a sprinkling of opponents. Wood, whose aim was to get the nomination for mayor, was the chief quote-unquote trimmer, though each side made concessions. Various equivocal resolutions touching the slavery question were adopted, and a new Tammany General Committee, comprising barn burners, mild hunkers, and ultra hunkers, was formed. The barn burners and hunkers then agreed upon a coalition in state and city, uniting on Horatio Seymour for governor. Despite the diplomacy of Wood, who had arranged this pact, an explosion was narrowly averted a few weeks later. Finding themselves in a majority at a slimly attended meeting of the General Committee in the latter part of September 1850, the uncompromising hunkers denounced parleying with free soilers, and by a vote of 16 to 11 refused to sustain Seymour. As soon as their action became known, there was a burst of indignation. The threat was made that, if the committee did not rescind it, the Council of Sachems, most of whom, it seems, would had won over to his plans, would turn it out of Tammany Hall. The members of the committee hastened to meet, the ultra-hunkers were routed, and the state candidates strongly endorsed. Chapter 17 Defeat and Victory, 1850-1852 Under a new charter, the mayor's term was extended to two years, and the time of election, with that of the other city officers, was changed to November. The latter change gave great satisfaction to the leaders, for it enabled them to trade votes. Trading grew to such an extent that charges became common of this or that nominee for president, governor, state senator, and so on, being sold out by the leaders to ensure their own election. The Tammany organization, too, had made a change. It had adopted the convention system of nominating. This new method was much more satisfactory to the leaders because the election of delegates to the conventions could be easily controlled and the risk of having prearranged nominations overruled by an influx of gangs into the great popular meeting was eliminated. A show of opposition to the proposed program was, however, still necessary. 
The first general convention was held in October 1850. Fernando Wood was the leading candidate for mayor, and it was certain that he would be nominated. But the first ballot showed a half-dozen competitors. The second ballot, however, disclosed the real situation, and Wood was chosen by 29 votes to 22 for John J. Sisko. Wood was a remarkable man. As a tactician and organizer, he was the superior both of his distant predecessor Burr and of his successors Tweed and Sweeney. He was born in Philadelphia in June 1812 of Quaker parents. At the age of 13, he was earning two dollars a week as a clerk. Later, he became a cigar maker and tobacco dealer, and still later, a grocer. As a lad, he was pugnacious. In a Harrisburg barroom, he once floored with a chair a state senator who had attacked him. But he seems to have been amenable to good advice. For once, when a Quaker reprimanded him for his excessive use of tobacco, with the observation, quote, Friend, thee smokes a good deal, unquote, he at once threw away his cigar and gave up the habit. Coming to New York, he engaged in several business enterprises, all the while taking a considerable interest in politics. He was elected to Congress in 1840, serving one term. Gradually he came to make politics his vocation. Political manipulation before his day was, at the best, clumsy and crude. Under his facile genius and painstaking care, <laughs> political manipulation developed to the rank of an exact science. He devoted himself for years to ingratiating himself with the factors needed in carrying elections. He curried favor with the petty criminals of the five points, the boisterous roughs of the river edge and the swarms of immigrants, as well as with the peaceable and industrious mechanics and laborers. And he won a following even among the businessmen, all these he marshaled systematically in the Tammany organization. Politics was his science, and the quote-unquote fixing of primaries his specialty. In this he was perhaps without peer. His unscrupulousness was not confined to politics. During this brief campaign he was repeatedly charged with commercial frauds as well as with bribery and dishonest practices at the primaries. A year later he was shown to have been guilty before this time of having defrauded a partner of $8,000, and he escaped conviction by the merest technicality. Political standards in the fifties were not high, but the rowdy character of a great part of Tammany's membership, and the personal character of many of its nominees, particularly that of Wood, proved too much to bear, even for those days, and a strong revulsion followed. Former mayors Habemeyer and Mickle, John McKeon, a leader of note, and other prominent Democrats revolted. The election resulted in a Whig victory, Ambrose C. Kingsland securing 22,546 votes to 17,973 for Wood. A great Democratic defection was shown by the fact that Horatio Seymour carried the city by only 705 plurality. So general were the expressions of contempt for the character of the wigwam that the sachems resolved to invoke again the spirit of patriotism and consequently fixed upon a revival of the old custom of
of Independence Day celebrations. In 1851, the ruling council of Sachems was a mixture of compromise, barn burners, and hunkers. The Committee of Arrangements, Elijah Purdy, Daniel Delavan, Richard Connolly, Stephen Duryea, and three others, sent invitations filled with lofty and patriotic sentiments to various national politicians. Barn burners also were invited, the conciliatory sachems being sincerely tired of a warfare which threatened to exile them all from the sinecures of city and state offices. The Society of Tammany, or Columbian Order, the circular said, had originated, quote, in a fraternity of patriots, solemnly consecrated to the independence, the popular liberty, and the federal union of the country, unquote. Tammany's councils were, quote, ever vigilant for the preservation of those great national treasures from the grasp alike of the treacherous and the open spoiler, unquote. It had, quote, enrolled in its brotherhood many of the most illustrious statesmen, patriots, and heroes that had constellated the heroic banners of the past and present age, and it remained to the present hour, unquote, the glowing lines read on, quote, instinct with its primitive spirit and true to the same sacred trust, unquote. The rhetoric delivered at the celebration was quite as pretentious and high-flown, but the phrases made no impression on the public mind. No impartial observer denied that the wigwam's moral prestige with the state and national party was, for the time, gone. Throughout the country the belief prevailed that the politicians of the metropolis deserved no respect, merit, or consideration, and that they were purchasable and transferable like any stock in Wall Street. If before 1846 nominations were sold, it was not an open transaction. Since then, the practice of selling them had gradually grown, and now the bargaining was unconcealed. Upon the highest bidder, the honors generally fell. Whigs and Tammany men alike were guilty. If one aspirant offered $1,000, another offered $2,000. <laughs> Sounds like the papacy in the Middle Ages. But these sums were merely a beginning. Committees would impress upon the candidate the fact that a campaign costs money. More of the quote-unquote boys would have to be quote-unquote seen. Such and such a quote-unquote ward healer needed quote-unquote pacifying. A band was a proper embellishment with a parade to boot, and voters needed quote-unquote persuading. And at the last moment, a dummy candidate would be brought forward as a man who had offered much more for the nomination. Then the bidder, at $2,000, would have to pay the difference, and if the office sought was a profitable one, the candidate would be a lucky man if he did not have to disgorge as much as $15,000 before securing the nomination. <laughs> what rank corruption! Some candidates were bled for as much as $20,000, and even this was a moderate sum compared to the prices which obtained a few years later. The primaries were attended by gangs more rowdy and corrupt than ever. Whig ward committees often sold over to Tammany, and Whig votes, bought and traded, swelled the ballot boxes at the Wigwam primaries. Nearly every saloon was the headquarters of a gang whose energies and votes could be bought. In Tammany Hall, 
an independent Democrat dared not speak unless he had previously made terms with the controlling factions, according to a relatively fixed tariff of rates. The primaries of both parties had become so scandalously corrupt as to command no respect. The discoveries of gold in California and Australia created in all classes a feverish desire for wealth. Vessel after vessel was arriving in the harbor with millions of dollars worth of gold dust. Newspapers and magazines were filled with glowing accounts of how poor men became rich in a dazzlingly short period. The desire for wealth became a mania and seized upon all callings. The effect was a still further lowering of the public tone. Standards were generally lost sight of, and all means of quote-unquote getting ahead came to be considered legitimate. Politicians, trafficking in nominations and political influence, found it a most auspicious time. The condition was intensified by the influx of the hordes of immigrants driven by famine and oppression from Ireland, Germany, and other European countries. From over 129,000 arriving at the port of New York in 1847, the number increased to 189,000 in 1848, 220,000 in 1849, 212,000 in 1850, 289,000 in 1851, and 300,000 in 1852. Some of these sought homes in other states, but a large portion remained in the city. Though many of these were thrifty and honest, numbers were ignorant and vicious, and the pauper and criminal classes of the metropolis grew larger than ever. The sharper-witted among them soon mended their poverty by making a livelihood of politics. To them, political rights meant the obtaining of money or the receiving of jobs under the city, state, or national government in return for the marshalling of voters at the polls. Regarding issues, they bothered little and knew less. There's your history of elections in the United States. The effects of the Whig and Native American denunciation of the alien vote were now seen. The naturalized citizens almost invariably sided with Tammany Hall, although there were times when, by outbidding the wigwam, the Whigs were enabled to use them in considerable numbers. Despite an unusual degree of public condemnation, Tammany managed, by a temporary pacification of the factions, and a general use of illegal votes, to carry the city in the fall of 1851 by nearly 2,000 majority. But it could not hold the regular democratic strength, for Wright, the candidate for governor, received over 3,000 majority. Frauds were notorious. In one of the polling places of the 19th Ward, the Wigwam's candidates for aldermen and assistant aldermen were counted in after a mob invaded it and forced the Whig inspectors to flee for their lives. <laughs> oh, oh the, the, the prestigious, illustrious, trustworthy history of American, of the American political process. <laughs> Here it is, folks. Here's a real history of it. When the votes for the assembly ticket were counted, 552 were announced, although there were only <laughs> 503 names on the poll list. This was but an instance of the widespread repeating and violence. With its large majority in the common council, 
Tammany at first made a feint at curtailing city expenses. The taxpayers complained that the taxes were upwards of three million five hundred thousand dollars, for which there was little apparent benefit. The new common council made professions of giving a spotless administration, but before its term was over, it had generally earned the expressive title of the Forty Thieves. This was the body that, with lavish promises of reform, replaced the Whig Common Council. William M. Tweed, an alderman in the Forty Thieves Common Council, was busy in the fall of this year, indignantly defending, in speeches and public writings, the aldermen from the numerous charges of corruption. But, as will be seen, these charges were by no means groundless. Since the passings of the Equal Rights Party, the mechanics and laborers had taken no concerted part in politics, not even as a faction. But at this period, they were far from being lethargic. The recent discoveries of gold and silver had quickened. The pulse to business, enormously increasing the number of transactions and the aggregate of profits. The workers were determined to have their share of this prosperity and acted accordingly. Old trade unions were rapidly strengthened, and new ones formed. More pay and shorter hours of work were demanded. Between the spring of 1850 and the spring of 1853, nearly every trade in the city engaged in one or more strikes, with almost invariable success. Having now no sincere leaders to prompt them to concerted political action, the workers oscillated listlessly between the two parties. They had lost the tremendous influence secured in the thirties, and the business element had again become dominant. Legislature and common council vied with each other in granting exploitative charters, and the persons who secured these, generally by bribery, were considered the leaders of public opinion. Every company demanding special privileges of the state maintained its lobby at Albany. The city council was more easily reached, and was generally dealt with personally. Fortunes were made by plundering the city and state, and while the conduct of the agents and actual performers in this wholesale brigandage, the lobbyists, legislators, and aldermen. Was looked upon somewhat doubtfully. Their employers stood before the world as the representatives of virtue and respectability. The one force which might have stood as a bulwark against this system of pillage had been so completely demoralized by its political experiences that it could now only look on. And let matters drift as they would. In the Baltimore Democratic Convention, the wigwam was represented by so boisterous a delegation that its speakers were denied a hearing. Among the delegates were Captain Rinders, Mike Walsh, and a number of the same kind. Cass was their favorite, and they shouted for him lustily, but. On attempting to speak for him, they were invariably howled down, despite the fact that Cass had a majority of the convention almost to the end of the balloting. The wigwam, however, lost no time in endorsing the nomination of Franklin Pierce. In this ratification, the barn burners joined, ardently urging the election of candidates on a platform. Which held that Congress had no power under the Constitution quote, 
to interfere with the domestic institutions of the states, unquote, which advocated compromise measures, the execution of the fugitive slave law, and which opposed all attempts to agitate the slavery question. The election of November 1852 was not only for president and congressman, but for a long list of officials, city and state. Each of the wigwam factions began playing for advantage. On July 16th, a portion of the general committee met, apparently to accept an invitation to attend the funeral of Henry Clay. The barn burners, finding themselves in a majority, sprang a trick upon the hunkers by adopting a plan of primary elections favorable to their side. Later the general committee, in full meeting, substituted another plan, and a great hubbub followed. A, quote, committee of conciliation, unquote, composed of members of both factions was appointed. When it met on August 20th, the halls, lobbies, and entrances of Tammany Hall were filled with a vicious assortment of persons chiefly inimical to the general committee. Wrote one chronicler, quote, The bar room was the scene of several encounters and knockdowns. It was only necessary for a man to express himself strongly on any point when down he went by the hammer fist of one of the fighting men, unquote. Even members of the committee, while passing in and out of the room, were intimidated. Daniel E. Sickles was threatened with personal violence, and it might have gone hard with him had he not taken the precaution of arming himself with a buoy and revolver. Members' lives were constantly threatened. The scenes of uproar and confusion were indescribable. Mr. Sickles, for his own safety, had to jump from a window to Frankfort Street, and other members were forced to retreat through secret byways. It was near daybreak when the factions consented to leave the wigwam. The anxiety of each was explained by the proceedings at the primaries. The faction having a majority of the inspectors secured by far the greater number of votes, and consequently the delegates who had the power of making nominations. At the primaries of August 1852, fraud and violence occurred at nearly every voting place. In some instances, one faction took possession of the polls and prevented the other from voting. In others, both factions had control by turns, and fighting was desperate. One party ran away with a ballot box and carried it off to the police station. Many ballot boxes, it was alleged, were half-filled with votes before the election was even opened. Wards containing less than 1,000 legal Democratic voters yielded 2,000 votes, and a ticket which not a hundred voters of the ward had seen was elected by six or seven hundred majority. Whigs, boys, and paupers voted. The purchasable, who flocked to either party, according to the price, came out in force, and ruffianism dominated the whole. Boy, was I ever right. This book documents the voter fraud all throughout American history. I didn't think it would be this bad, folks. I, I, I didn't think it would be this rife throughout the whole book. I was Remember, if you listen to the very first episode, I predicted I think we're going to encounter some historical American voter fraud that we've never been taught. I was right in my prediction. Because I'm reading this cold. Uh, but I, I didn't think it would be this bad. I frankly didn't think it would be this rampant. Wow. Back to the book. Uh, 
the police dared not interfere. Their appointment was made by the alderman and assistant alderman with the nominal consent of the mayor exclusively on political grounds and for one year. The policeman's livelihood depended upon the whims of those most concerned in the ward turmoils. A hard lot was the policeman's. On the one hand, public opinion demanded that he arrest offenders. On the other, most of the aldermen had their gangs of lawbreakers at the polls. Pay no attention to the bill collector calling in the background. And to arrest one of these might mean his dismissal. But this was not all. The politics of the common council changed frequently. And to ensure himself his position, the guardian of the peace must conduct himself according to the difficult mean of aiding his own party to victory and yet of giving no offense to the politicians of the other party. Hence, whenever a political disturbance took place, the policeman instantly, it was a saying, became, quote, deaf and blind and generally invisible, unquote. The necessity of uniting to displace the Whigs from the millions of city patronage and profit brought the factions to an understanding. Jacob A. Westervelt, a moderate hunker and a shipbuilder of wealth, who was considered the very essence of quote-unquote respectability, and a contrast to Wood, was nominated for mayor. Tammany planned to have its candidates swept in on the presidential current. National issues were made dominant, and the city responded by giving the Pierce electors 11,159 plurality and electing the whole organization ticket. Fraud was common. No registry law was in force to hinder men from voting, as it was charged some did, as often as twenty times. Vote early and vote often. On the other hand, eighty thousand tickets purporting to be democratic intended for distribution by the Whigs, but not containing the name of a single Democrat, were seized at the post office and carried in triumph to the wigwam. Tammany once more had full control of the city. Chapter 18 Hard Shells and Soft Shells, 1852-1858 the Barnburner hunker factional fight was succeeded by that of the hard shells and soft shells. How the ludicrous nicknames originated, it is not possible to say. The soft shells were composed of a remnant of the Barnburners and that part of the hunkers who believed in a full union with the Barnburners, especially in the highly important matter of distributing offices. The hard shells were the old hunkers who disavowed all connection with the barn burners or free soilers, except so far as to get their votes. This division also extended to other parts of the state, where perhaps real differences of political principle were responsible for it. But in the city, the fundamental point of contention was the booty of office. The hard shells boasted in 1852 of a majority of the Tammany General Committee, which met on December 2nd to choose inspectors for the ward elections of delegates to the General Committee for 1853. The control of these inspectors was the keynote of the situation, for they would return such delegates as they pleased. Angered at the appointment of 
hard shell inspectors, the soft shells broke in the door of the committee room, assaulted the members of the committee with chairs, fractured some heads, and forced the hards to flee for refuge to the Astor House. Agreeable to quote-unquote usages, the departing general committee instructed the delegates of its successor to assemble in Tammany Hall in January 13, 1853, to be installed as the general committee for the ensuing year. Until this installation, the committee of the last year remained in power. In the interval, the sachems who, in the peculiar mix of politics, were for the most part soft shells, decided to take a hand in the game of getting control of the organization and therefore called a meeting for the same night and at the same time. The object of the old general committee was to allow only delegates whose seats were uncontested to vote on the organization, or the contest of seats, which would return a quote-unquote hard-shell committee. The sachems, on the contrary, favored voting by those who had the endorsement of two or three inspectors. The hard-shells insisted that the sachems had unwarrantably interfered, that this was the first time in the history of the society of any inference as to the manner of organizing the general committee, that the only power the sachems had was to decide between contending parties for the use of the hall for political meetings, and that even then their power was doubtful. The Grand Sachem ordered the doors of the meeting room locked till 7.30 o'clock, at which hour both factions streamed in. Soon there were two meetings in the same room, each with a chairman, and each vociferously trying to shout down the other. Neither accomplished anything, and both adjourned, and kept adjourning from day to day, awaiting positive action by the society. The soft-shell section of the general committee called a meeting for January 20th, but it was prohibited by the sachems. When doubt of their authority was expressed, the sachems produced a lease executed in 1842 to Howard, the lessee of the property, by the Tammany Society, in which he agreed that he would not lease, either directly or indirectly, the hall or any part of the building to any other political party or parties whatever, calling themselves committees, whose general political principles did not appear to him or the sachems to be in accordance with the general political principles of the Democratic Republican General Committee of New York City, of which Elijah F. Purdy was then chairman. Howard also agreed that, quote, if there should be at any time a doubt arising in his mind or that of his assigns, or in the mind of the Grand Sachem of the Tammany Society for the time being, in ascertaining the political character of any political party that should be desirous of obtaining admission to Tammany Hall for the purpose of holding a political meeting, then either might give notice in writing to the father of the council of the Tammany Society, in which event it was the duty of the father of the council to assemble the grand council who would determine in the matter and whose decision should be final, conclusive, and binding." Unquote. Of the thirteen sachems, eleven were soft shells, a predominance due to the activity of the barn burners. The hard shells, without doubt, 
wherein a majority of the Tammany society and in Tammany Hall, but they had taken no such pains as had their opponents to elect their men. The Sachem's meeting on January 20th, professedly to decide the merits of the contest, called for the ward representatives in turn. The hard shells refused to answer or to acknowledge the sachem's authority to interfere with the primary elections of the people. The sachems then named by resolution the general committee they favored, thus deciding in favor of the soft shell committee. There was no little suppressed excitement since the members of the Tammany Society, it was naively told, though allowed to be present, were not allowed to speak. Alderman Thomas J. Barr, a member of the Tammany Society and chairman of the Hard Shell Committee, handed to the sachems on behalf of his associates an energetic protest. Summarized, it read as follows, quote, Tammany Society is a private organization incorporated for charitable purposes. There is nothing in its charter, constitution, or bylaws making it a political organization in any sense of the term. The Democrats of New York City have never, in any manner or by any act, vested in the society the right to prescribe the rules for their government in matters of political organization. The society comprises among its members men belonging to all the different political parties of the day. The only political test of admission to membership is to be a Republican in favor of the Constitution of the United States. It is, besides, a secret society whose transactions are known only to its own officers and members, except so far as might be the pleasure of the Council to make the proceedings public. It can never be tolerated that a body which, in the language of its charter, was created to carry into effect the benevolent purpose of affording relief to the indigent and distressed, and which is wholly independent of the great body of the democracy, shall be permitted to sit in judgment upon the primary organization of the Democratic Republican Party of the City of New York. And such a state of things, if its absurdity be not too great for serious consideration, would amount to a despotism of the most repugnant character and render the Democratic Party of the city an object of contempt and ridicule everywhere. Tammany Society owns a portion of the premises known as Tammany Hall, which is let to Mr. Howard and forms the plant of his hotel. This fact is all that gives to the Tammany Society any, even the least political significance. The general committee derives its powers from the people, who alone can take them away. The committee, in its objects, its organization, and its responsibilities, to a popular constituency, is wholly distinct and independent of the Tammany society, its councils, or its officers. And to be efficient for any good purpose, must always so remain, leaving to the Tammany Society its legitimate duty of excluding from Tammany Hall those who are hostile to the democracy and its principles." Unquote. In the barroom, many leaders of the excluded faction were assembled, surrounded by their fighting men. When the sachem's adverse decision was announced, their anger found vent in a sputter of oaths and threats, and the sum of fifteen thousand dollars was subscribed on the spot for the building of a rival Tammany Hall. <laughs>
It is almost needless to say that the rival hall was never built. The sachems later replied to the protest with the defense that their lease to Howard obliged them to act as they did. By that lease, the succession of Elijah F. Purdy's committee alone was at liberty to meet as a general committee in Tammany Hall. The sachems had not recognized Barr's committee as such, and moreover did not admit the claim the hard-shell committee made of their right to hire a room separate from the majority in a building in which they had no property whatever. The Council of Sachems insisted that it had exercised the right of excluding so-called general committees before, that Tammany was a benevolent society, and that benevolent societies had the same right as others to determine who should occupy their property. The hard shells attempted to rout the soft shells at the regular meeting of the Tammany Society on February 12th, but the sachem's action was confirmed by a vote of 200 to less than a dozen. Each faction then strained to elect a majority of the sachems at the annual election on April 18th. Private circulars were distributed, that of the soft shells being signed by Isaac Fowler, Fernando Wood, Nelson Waterbury, John Cochran, and others. It breathed allegiance to the national and state administrations, the regular organization, and to the Baltimore platform. The hard shell circular had the signatures of Richard Connolly, Cornelius Bogardus, Jacob Brush, and others styling themselves the quote-unquote Old Line Democrats. The soft shells elected their ticket, and Isaac V. Fowler, afterward postmaster, was chosen Grand Sachem. This vote of a few score of private individuals decided the control of Tammany Hall and the lot of those who would share in the division of plunder for the next year. One friendly account had it thus, quote, With the exception of some few quarrels, which fortunately did not result in any personal damage to the disputants, the affair passed off very quietly. While the votes were counted upstairs, some interesting scenes were presented in the bar room, which was crowded with anxious expectance. Language of a rather exceptional character, such as political thieves, swindlers, etc., was employed unsparingly. But, as the majority was peaceably inclined, there were no heads fractured." Unquote. And that concludes this installment of The History of Tammany Hall by Gustavus Myers. You've been listening to Rejected Knowledge.